Good evening. Uh, we're glad to be here again tonight, and we welcome you all here, and very thankful to have our second week here uh, of our study uh, for our Summer of Faith series, looking at the typology uh, in the Old Testament uh, between uh, people and events in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful to have David Morris here tonight talk about Moses uh, in that. Uh, don't have anything much in the way of announcements. do ask you to be prayerful for the family of Doug McCormick. His funeral was today uh, in a very uh, time of grief for them. And so just be praying uh, for them uh, and keep them in your prayers as they go through a lot of, a lot of emotional things right now. I am thankful to have uh, David here. Uh, he and his wife Shelly were married in 2001. He has three teenage daughters, so I have given him great sympathy uh, with that. Uh, he is currently at the Highland Church of Christ in Columbia. Been there for 17 years. He taught 15 years, uh, for 15 years, at the Nashville School of Preaching, uh, and 13 years at the Columbia Bible Institute. And he serves on the Columbia Academy uh, Board of Directors. So we're very thankful to have him here tonight. Look forward to his lesson. Hello? Can you hear me now? Oh, you can. I can hear me now. Okay. Sorry, buddy. All right. Anyway, all right. So I understand, wow, now I've got to speak lower, right? Okay, so I understand last week you started out with the typology of Adam as uh, sort of this prefigure of Christ. When you go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible, you're talking about the creation narrative and how God said that everything was good in its creative in its creation there at the created order. But, but very quickly it began to fall apart. And in fact, we have a succession of rebellions that take place early on in Scripture. It starts with what we commonly think of as the great fall. But, but very quickly thereafter, when we get into chapter 6, it says every inclination of the heart of man was only evil all the time. And because of that wickedness came the great flood. And right after that, right after God destroys the world based on that, we have what really amounts to what appears to me in the Tower of Babel to be an invasion attempt where human beings in their arrogance decided we're going to scale up into the halls of heaven itself and prevent God from ever destroying the world again. And you know, if we were God, what would we do in this circumstance? I remember uh, reading one time the words of Martin Luther where he said, if, if the world had treated us the way that, that we have treated God, I would have kicked the wretched thing to pieces long ago. God does something very unexpected, though, in spite of these three great rebellions. When I was a kid, uh, I grew up watching a lot of 80s television series, 80s classic television and 80s movies. And one of the, one of the shows that, that I can remember you know, very vividly was watching The A-Team. Uh, the A-Team was a show that was, I don't know, in, in some respects as a 
young boy a mindless fun on some level. And if you go back and watch that now, I just got to warn you, don't you know, save yourself some time. It doesn't age very well, okay? But uh, it, it was an awesome show when I was a kid. And one of the things about this show that strikes me, though, is that so many of the plot lines revolved around the idea or concept of rescue. I mean, there's always somebody in distress, always somebody they're getting hired to, to go and to save, somebody whose lives are in danger. We value as a people, as the created people of God, we value the concept and principle of rescue, of helping people who are in trouble. And so that's one of the reasons we highly value our first responders. We love first responders. Why? Because there's something within all of us that respects and honors and values those who try to rescue other people, correct? My daughters have a list, a short list of their favorite rescue movies. So their favorite Rescue the Princess movie is The Princess Bride. Their favorite Rescue the Hostages movie is Die Hard. Uh, the, their favorite uh, uh, movie about rescuing friends is Toy Story 2. Their favorite, uh, you know, military self-sacrifice, Rescue Your Buddies movie is Saving Private Ryan. We understand the concept of rescue. What God does, in spite of these unbelievable attempts at rebellion, God decides he is going to create a rescue team, as it were, through the family of Abram, later Abraham. And what he is told, you know this very well, in Genesis chapter 12, that your descendants will number like the stars. In fact, your offspring, go outside, look up at the stars. This is what, what a picture of your offspring will eventually look like. One of those offspring to very quickly come along was someone named Joseph. Joseph grew up in an incredibly dysfunctional family where he was very clearly the family favorites. All his brothers filled with their hearts with jealousy. And so they decide to do what? We're going to sell our brother into slavery. We're going to make like he's been killed and we're going to reap the benefit. But what they meant for evil, God meant for what? Good. And so he turns it in his own favor. And by the end, by the culmination of the Joseph story, we see Joseph almost as a type of Christ, don't we? Of prefiguring of Christ. Because in the Joseph story, we have his exaltation. He sits at the right hand of the Pharaoh himself. He's the vizier. He forgives on the basis of grace his brothers who had betrayed him. And he procures a rescue for his own people. Well, that brings us, doesn't it, to Exodus chapter 1. Because Joseph dies at age 110. And 350 years follow thereafter. And as you're looking in your Bible at Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, it says, There arose a new Pharaoh, a new king over Egypt, who did not know who? Joseph. And so the people of God are going to fall into disfavor. Around this time in ancient Near Eastern history, you'll find records of a people known as the Hyksos. The Hyksos were Semites, a.k.a. Hebrews. And they became so numerous that they really took over the area of Egypt known as Lower Egypt. It's not on a map lower. It's called Lower Egypt because uh, it is closer, uh, closer down uh, at sea level. It's a lower ground. But in around the mid-1600s, they basically took over this entire area and held it for about 100 years until Pharaoh Achmos came along and through his military uh, campaign drove them from the land. And we could surmise, and most scholars believe, that this took place right before this text we're reading in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. I don't know, have you ever had a job where you were a valued employee, and you did a good job, and you loved your work, but there came to be a new boss, and that boss, even though you were doing the same level and quality of work you were doing before, that boss did not seem to appreciate you the way the former regime had appreciated you. There's something like that happening on a national level with the people of God. What about, let's, let's think in terms of a birth. Isn't a childbirth one of the greatest events we could ever experience in life? I mean, it's awesome. I, I was present for the birth of all three of my daughters. 
Uh, on one, one of those uh, births, my wife punched me. She will deny that she did, but I believe I was in the right frame of mind, and I remember it pretty well. Even though a childbirth is a joyous thing, it also involves pain, whether in the childbirthing process or getting punched either way, right? <laughs> and so there is a joyful thing in the nation of Israel being born, but also there is some pain that happens at the front end of it. If you think about the name of the book itself, Exodus, it comes from, you know, kind of a compound of, of Greek, ek, which means out of, and hodas, or uh, kind of a word that means road or way, and so you have this idea of going out. If you look at the title of the book, though, in Hebrew, it's uh, Ve'ele Shemot B'nai Yisrael, Ve'ele Shemot B'nai Yisrael. So Shemot is the word for names. And so if you were to look in the Hebrew Bible, the name of this second book of your Bible is actually called Names. And that's because that's the way it is with all the Pentateuch. It starts out with the main idea in the very beginning of the book. But when you think about that and just kind of think of the, the various ways that this book is named, it's called Names in the Hebrew Bible because there's this family element to it. Israel entered Egypt as a family, they're going to exit out of it as something even more than a family. They're going to be a nation. So what I want to do with our study tonight is I'm going to revolve our study around four main ideas as we think of Moses as a deliverer. And the four main ideas you see up on the screen, domination under Egyptian bondage, chapters 1 through 12, freedom in chapters 13 through 18, Revelation chapters 19 through 31, where they go to Mount Sinai, and thereafter identity, where they are really God's unique people. And by the time we get to the end of the study, we're going to see all four of these ideas hold special significance for us as New Testament Christians as well. Let's start out with the first of these ideas, domination. If you go back to our text in Exodus chapter 1 verse 11, Notice that the decision of the Pharaoh was to inflict upon the Hebrews heavy burdens, such that verse 14, it made their lives bitter, and at the end of the verse, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And to cull the numbers, if you drop down to Exodus 1.22, you'll notice it says, every son, the Pharaoh commanded, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. How brutal, how brutal. But then we go to Exodus chapter 2. I want you to look there in verse 1, beginning there, it says, Now a man, so the Holy Spirit now moves and zooms the lens of Scripture down to a single family. A man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Le Levi, and the woman conceived and gave birth to a son, and when she saw that, what? What did she see? That he was, what? Beautiful. She hid him there for three months. Uh, just as a side note, I'm going to go down this little cul-de-sac. It's interesting for me to note that Moses is described here as a baby. Can I ask you guys a question? Who wrote this book? Moses? <laughs> and what's he saying about himself? <laughs> oh, I was a beautiful baby. You know, my mama told me so. <laughs> Basically, that's what he's saying, right? I just think that's a little interesting tidbit. But then you get to Exodus 2 and verse 3, and she can no longer hide Moses, okay? So what she decides is she's going to put him in a basket, cover it with tar and pitch, and release him to the Nile. But she keeps watch. And notice in verse 3, it says, The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her female attendants working alongside the Nile. She saw the basket. Look at verse 6. When she opened it, she saw the child. Now look down in verse 10 and notice that this, this woman, the daughter of Pharaoh, she names Moses Moshe. Now the Hebrew word Moshe sounds like the Hebrew verb to draw water, but it also has an etymological root in the Egyptian language, and it's very likely that she, being Pharaoh's daughter, uses sort of an Egyptian-style name to name him. And so Moses is connected 
with an idea begotten of the God, and then you would name the Egyptian God. But the Egyptian God's name is dropped from the title. And, of course, you wouldn't want to exalt the name of that deity in a book like Exodus. It's also possible, just as a side note, that Aaron and Miriam are also Egyptian-based names, neither here nor there. But she names him Moshe, Moses. Now, it's hard to deny the influence that Moses has had on world culture. In fact, in the mid-'90s, there was a book written uh, called The Jewish 100, and the author there argues that Moses is the most influential Jew to ever live and walk on planet Earth. I think you and I, we would reorder the list a little bit, wouldn't we? We'd put Jesus number one. We could make a very strong argument possibly for Paul at number two. But it's hard to kick Moses out of the top three, isn't it? I mean, this guy's influence on planet Earth is undeniable. As he grows up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he is somebody who has everything at his disposal. He grows up with a silver spoon in hand in the world's most advanced culture of the day. The Egyptians uh, apparently uh, had some way that they surmised that the earth was round. Sorry, you flat earthers in the room right now. The Egyptians also uh, somewhat calculated, believe it or not, the, the distance of the earth to the sun. They had these temples of worship to the Egyptian high god Ra, but also those places functioned as very high-level learning centers. And so they were sort of the Harvard of the day. And there's no doubt that Moses grew up access to all of this type of knowledge. And in addition to that, the book of Hebrews says he, has, he had access to all the riches of ancient Egypt before him. Just as a side note, uh, one of Egypt's only two Female pharaohs, Queen Hatshepsut, possibly could have been the woman who drew Moses out of the Nile before, she, before her father died, and she had a stepson named Tutmos III who could possibly have grown up in the same household with Moses. Now imagine the tension between those two. And then maybe he is actually the Pharaoh who is in charge when Moses comes back to demand the release of his people. There are many scholars who believe that's a possibility. Look there in Exodus chapter 2, though, and you'll notice that uh, as he grows up, he has a realization that he is Hebrew by descent. And so he went out uh, to his fellow Hebrews, and he looked at their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew One uh, of his fellow Hebrews, look at verse 12, he looked this way and that. What's he about to do? Folks, this is premeditated. And so he kills the Egyptian, buries him, thinks nobody has seen him. Next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting. He tries to break it up. They get mad because he's breaking up their fights. And one of them says to him, are you going to try to kill us like you did yesterday? He immediately becomes terrified. Look at chapter 2, verse 15. When the word got to Pharaoh about this matter, he tried to what? Kill Moses. But Moses fled the presence of Pharaoh, settled in the land of Midian. If you look at this map, he's traveling all the way down here, way, way down to this little area on the lower right-hand side of the map. While he's there, notice verse 21. He meets a priest and his seven daughters. He marries one of the priest's daughters, Zipporah, has a son while he's there. And then Scripture telescopes back out. And we have this collection of verses beginning in verse 23. Look there with me. It says, Now it came to pass in the course of these many days that the king of Egypt died. Notice verse 24. God heard the groanings of the Hebrew people. Can we pause a minute and sit on that verse? I don't know about you. The world's driving me nuts. Now think about our role as light bearers and people who project grace and mercy as followers of God in this culture. And I look around at the horrors and the violence 
that's going on right now and how you really can't have a conversation with anybody because, quite frankly, they've rejected all laws of logic and labeled all of that. And I want to just say as we pause on this verse, never discount the power of prayer because what does this verse say? God heard their what? Groaning. I believe that is as true today as it's ever been. Moses' life, somebody, various commentators have chopped it up into thirds of 40 years each. There are those who said that in the first 40 years, Moses lived a life as a son of Egypt, a golden child as it were. In the middle 40 years, he wandered as a nobody, getting his backside of the desert degree where he was being humbled, got his BSD, okay? And in the last 40 years of his life, he became God's somebody, God's own chosen deliverer. And so that will bring us now to our second major idea where we move from a time of domination to a time of freedom. And here's where Moses' role as a deliverer comes to life. What's interesting to me is that when God hears their groaning in verse 24, he doesn't send the angel Gabriel, he does not send the archangel Michael, What he does instead is he sends a washed out 80-year-old ex-murdering shepherd now living in the middle of nowhere. And with this man, he's going to use him to deliver thousands of people. This is the way God normally functions. You know the story of how this uh, unfolds. In Exodus chapter 3, we have Moses out tending to his duties as a shepherd. He sees a bush that is burning but not consumed. He's fascinated. He draws near. And astonishingly, uh, unbelievably, the bush starts talking to him. And when you get down to verse 10, notice there in verse 10, uh, the bush, having identified himself as the Lord says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may exoxase, so that you may bring them out. It's kind of this Related idea to Exodus, so that you will bring them out of Egypt. And then we come to that monumental verse 14. You know this verse so well, don't you? Here it is. God said to Moses, I, what? I am who I am. And you shall go to Moses, uh, go to Pharaoh. You shall go to my people and you shall tell them the I am has sent me to you for I, the Lord, am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he makes this statement. This is my memorial name forever. This is a powerful, powerful text. We have here Moses really being introduced, as it were, reintroduced to the, to the sacred name of God. It's called the sacred tetragrammaton. It's the four consonants, yod He vav He. This is God's own name. God is not God's name. God is a title. I am a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a preacher. Those are all titles, but David is my name. Yahweh is his name. And I've read a lot of articles over the years that It talks about what the meaning of the name could be and how it should properly be translated. And uh, I respect those things, but I think in the context of what we're reading right here, I think he, he has this description, I am, that is, he is the Lord, the Most High God, over and against all the Egyptian deities. He's the real thing. And not only that, the name of God is tied in with the idea that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that means that this name is to be associated with the God who keeps his promises. So there's a lot of weight that's carried with this name. So what's Moses' reaction? He comes up with excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. Four, right? Excuse number one. What if they don't believe me? I'll make sure they do. Excuse number two, I'm slow of speech. Well, I'll give you a helper. Excuse number three, someone else would be better, but you're the one. And then I love these honesty as, as all of these kind of fail. I just don't want to do it. And God gets a little, little irritated about it. May I just suggest and float to you, what about you? 
You know, some of the church's greatest critics are people who are incredibly creative in finding a way to avoid serving. Moses is trying hard here, but he fails. And so Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh himself. In Exodus chapter 5, look there now with me and notice how the text unfolds. Moses and Aaron come and say to Pharaoh, in the name of Yahweh, anytime you see L-O-R-D in all caps, that's the, the English text trying to tell you, this is the name Yahweh, okay? So I'm coming in the name of Yahweh, and he is saying, let my, what, people go. And Pharaoh's response, verse 2, who is Yahweh? I don't know this God. I don't know his name. I do not know Yahweh, and I will not let the people go. And so flip forward now to Exodus chapter 12 and notice verse 12 where Yahweh says this. He says, against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment for I am Yahweh. And what follows is 10 successive plagues. And each of these plagues, you've heard this well over the years, right? Each of these plagues has some kind of connection to some type of Egyptian deity and is a slap in the face to that particular deity. But I want to notice just the last two plagues in particular because plague number nine would have been unthinkable in an Egyptian setting because to them the most high God was the Egyptian sun god, Ra. He was mighty, unconquerable. And at his side was the sky god Osiris. And what does Yahweh do but destroy both their powers in causing the sky to to become dark? And still, Pharaoh will not relent. And so what comes afterwards is a parallel to what Pharaoh has done to the Hebrews. In the 10th plague, there comes the death of the firstborn of all in Egypt. And this is a slap not only to one of the Egyptian gods, who is a god of reproduction, it's also a slap in the face to Pharaoh himself, who is thought to be a demigod. So if you look in your Bible at Exodus chapter 10, verse 27, there's this interesting interaction where it says, Yahweh hardened, Hazak, hardened Pharaoh's heart. What I find interesting about that word really means strengthen and it can also mean to confirm. There are really two cycles of these plagues that fall on Egypt. In the first cycle, listen to me, listen to me. In the first cycle of the plagues, over and over again, a plague happens and then Pharaoh, it is said of him in the text, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. But when you get to the second set, the second cycle of plagues, then the text will say, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You see, Pharaoh had free will to choose to obey or not. But once it was clear he was set in his ways, God is very much in his sovereign right to send a strong delusion to him and then use him to his greater purpose. May I just throw this out as an aside? Be very, very careful of rejecting the will of God for your life over and over and over and over again. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 says, God is still well within his right to those who are disobedient to send a strong delusion to them. Don't be in that category. Don't fall into that camp. Well, what, what happens with the 10th plague? We have the observance, the instruction of the observance of Passover where the faithful are to take the blood of a lamb and they are to smear it over the doorpost. Can I, can I ask you a couple of questions? You guys ready? Okay, what happens if you are a Hebrew family and this event occurs but you have not spread the blood of the lamb over your doorpost? What happens? You die. There's no promise of protection, right? Let me ask you another question. What happens... This might be far-fetched, but just play along with me, okay? What happens if you're an Egyptian and you're friends with a Hebrew family and you find yourself in a Hebrew household that night with the blood over the doorpost? What happens to that Egyptian family? They're safe. And why is that? What matters is the blood. 
What matters is the blood itself, the blood of the Lamb. This is one of those blockbuster moments of foreshadowing, which we're going to see in just a few minutes. So, look in your Bible at Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. It says, Now the sons of Israel requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. Okay, you getting the picture? Pharaoh says, okay, let them go. It's too much death, too much destruction to keep them. So they're on their way out of town. Hey, can we have some gold? Can we have some silver and some clothes? And what does the verse say there at the end of uh, verse 36? It says they plundered the Egyptians on their way out of town. And so verse 41 becomes a culminating verse for us, doesn't it, for this section. It says, at at the end of 430 years, on this very day, all the multitudes of Yahweh departed from the land of Egypt. We're told later on that there's 600,000 males. So the estimate, rough estimate, might be about 2 million people. It's a lot of people. Looking at Exodus 14, notice what happens next. Suddenly, Pharaoh is told that the people have fled, and he and his servants have a change of heart. And so notice what's said. It says, what is this we've done that we've let Israel go from serving us? In other words, they've had this, they've had this whole setup for so long, they don't know how to function as a society. And so they decide to lash out. Verse 7, Pharaoh took 600 select chariots. Verse 8, chased after the sons of Israel. Verse 9, chased them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahirath in front of Baal Zephon. So you get the idea. They found them, caught up to them in an encampment. And so you have about 2 million Hebrews in terror, probably outnumbering this force, but they're in chariots. They are the world's military superpower. They're about to maraud this group and slaughter them, no contest. So let your eyes drop down to verses 19 and 20 and notice the intervention of God because there's this strange object that appears. It lights their way by night and as a pillar of fire guards them, from Pharaoh's forces by day. It's the Shekinah, the glory cloud of God himself. When I was growing up, they used to have this movie on called The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. I don't think they even put that on TV anymore. I hadn't seen it on in a while. I don't think my daughters have ever even seen it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I do remember this, this is the moment in the movie, right, where Charlton Heston stands you know, heroically up on the rock and spreads forth his arms. And then what happens? The Red Sea parts. It's incredible. And the reason, only reason that's incredible is because this is actually what happens in Scripture. Notice in verse 14, verse 21, Moses reached out with his hands over the sea, and Yahweh swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, And the waters were divided, so the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and left. You know what happens after this. The Hebrew people find themselves safely on the other side. Pharaoh now has the ability to give chase. They go down into the water, but midway what happens? The waters as a wall, give way. And the sea resumes its natural shape. And Pharaoh and his chariots are no more. And peace reigns for the people. So that's going to lead us then to the third idea. It's revelation. Because now they're on the other side. What's going to happen? Well, God's going to lead them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And I want to ask you if you flip forward to Exodus 19. In the meantime, he is sustaining them with something called what, scholars? Manna. Have you ever read the Bible's description of manna? Do yourself a favor and read Exodus 16, 31. It's crispy cream from God, okay? Because it describes it as a wafer with honey on it. Sign me up, right? 
I'm all for that. I, you know, I've, I've worked hard to <laughs> show my support of Krispy Kreme over the years, as is evident. But, but God's sustaining them through this, through this journey. And, and so they come to the foot of Sinai. It's evident that God is there. There's lightning and thunder coming forth from the peak of the apex of the mountain. So the people stay down low while Moses ascends the mountain. And when he gets there, what unfolds is what really amounts to an ancient Near Eastern covenant cutting. A covenant is drawn out by Yahweh through Moses to the people. And it's a covenant that's meant, can I I use this phrase, to define the relationship. I think that's an important way to put it. So if you look in your Bible, look at Exodus 34 for just a moment, verse 27, 34, 27, it says, Yahweh also said to Moses, write down these words, for I have made a covenant with you and with Israel based on these words. Verse 28, Moses was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat food or drink water. Well, that sounds familiar. He wrote the Ten Commandments. That's a mistranslation by by this uh, New American Standard here. In the Hebrew Bible, it's never called the Ten Commandments. It's always the Ten uh, Davar or Davarim, Ten Words. But he wrote these things down on the tablets. Now, in ancient Near Eastern cultures, just notice that word tablets, plural. In ancient Near Eastern cultures, they had a particular practice. I have actually a book in my library that uh, has nearly for a span of about 1,200 years surrounding this time frame, has a record of all existing covenant agreements from the Hittites, everybody around that area, okay? And and one thing you find out very quickly is they make an original and then they make a copy. And so when you read in your Bible about they've got two tablets, it's very interesting to me that there are two tablets. I don't think there are five on one and five on the other. I think one's the original and one's the copy, and most scholars believe that's what's actually being placed into the Ark of the Covenant. Why does this law exist? I mean, these are people, let me just make this very clear. These are people who are chosen by God's grace, not because they're better than everybody else on planet Earth, not because they're more moral people. They are chosen by God's grace to be God's people. But these laws actually, hear what I'm, listen to me. These, God uses laws to shape the hearts of his people. And that's why they exist. And so for them, these laws help them to know how to avoid the things that will hurt the heart of God and their fellow man, and also the things that are going to make him happy, and it's going to deepen the relationship. So they had to define the relationship. That's what the laws do. I'll never forget when my middle daughter, um, so as Tim mentioned, I, have, uh, I currently live with three teenage daughters. I covet your prayers, okay? So I have an 18-year-old, 17-year-old, and 13-year-old. I grew up an only child. What in the world do I know about girls? Nothing. So when they were, you know, my, my first two were born uh, a year apart, so, you know, I'm very quickly in our household, I've got two daughters, right? And so I'm, I'm there with them, trying to play with them. And I'm just playing with stuff I know, superheroes, action figures, whatever. And when they're playing with Barbies, I'm down on the floor with Batman, okay? That's all I know. And there came a time when this is my middle daughter, Caitlin, she decided that we were going to get all the action figures together and we were going to have a wedding ceremony in the playroom. And it was between Barbie and... Batman, and I don't know where Ken went. Listen, I don't know about Ken on this particular day, but Ken was, was a no-show. But she had them all lined up in a row, right? We're just, you know, got the procession. Batman comes down. He's waiting on his bride. Here comes Barbie. I'm going somewhere with this. And Barbie comes down, and I'm like, okay, now what? So she decides she's going to do the words for the ceremony. She says, everybody listen, it's time for the wedding to begin. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you do can be held against you. And I start laughing, and she's like, what are you laughing at? I was like, no, please, go on, go on. She says, you have the right to an attorney, and you may kiss the bride. (laughs) I thought, 
You know, outside of my own wedding, this is the greatest wedding ceremony I've ever attended, okay? They had to define the relationship. That's what the law does. Well, I got a lot to do here in five minutes. So let's look at that last idea of identity. The rest of this story kind of unfolds where their identity becomes very apparent. They are people who have a die-hard, absolute allegiance to Yahweh as the one true God. May I pause right here, though, and just tell you that these four words we just looked at have a powerful parallel for our own lives. And if time will permit me, and I want to move very quickly, so let me, let me invite you to do so. Remember, I asked you to keep your ribbon right there in Matthew. Flip over there now, because what I want to do for about three minutes is I want to look at the Exodus motif in the New Testament. Primarily Matthew. I'm going to look at a couple of other texts real, real quickly. But I want you to notice that there's, there's huge parallel. Matthew sees Jesus as a new and greater Moses. And we see that right out of the gate. So when we go through this, you remember this, we, we looked at it. Exodus 1, where Pharaoh decides to kill all the firstborn children of the Hebrew people. And what do we find in, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, where Herod hears about the birth of the Christ child, and he becomes troubled. And what does the text say in verse 3? All Jerusalem became troubled with him. Why? Well, when Herod becomes trouble, he makes sure everybody else is upset with the things he does. Look in your verse 13 and 16, and you'll notice that like Pharaoh before him, he decides on the murder of children. But what we come to in verse 15 is a very interesting text because it says he stayed there. Where? Egypt. Jesus goes, his family, they flee, ironically, to the very place that the people of God had escaped bondage from. He goes there for safety. And he stays there until Herod dies. And this happens so that what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet will be fulfilled. What, Matthew? Out of Egypt I have called my son. The most natural place for Matthew to have put that text would be after Jesus comes back. But he puts it right here as he's leaving Israel. He is in essence, track with me quickly, he's in essence saying Israel's the new Egyptian bondage. That Herod is the new Pharaoh. The Pharisees are the new vipers biting and poisoning the people in the wilderness. This is a major statement. Jesus himself's going to take on the, the name of God that, that Moses heard from the burning bush. He says, I am that great I am. You remember from the Exodus, the great Shekinah, cloud of glory, which went before the people and protected them. Here's a verse that's going to blow your mind. Jude verse 5, where it says, I want to remind you, although you know everything once and for all, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of what? Mm, interesting. That glory cloud, the presence of God, present at the tabernacle, present later at the temple, but it leaves the temple, and we are never said to have it return until you get to John chapter 1, where it says, the word became flesh, and what? Tabernacled among us, and we beheld God's glory. Remember that lamb's blood over the doorpost? Jesus takes that and says, there's a new lamb's blood, and now you observe Israel's most important feast, in remembrance of me. And Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 10, remember all the people who passed through the sea? They were really baptized unto Moses. Are you ready? Here we go, final stretch. Matthew chapter 3. Jesus is baptized just as the people of God passed through the waters of the Exodus. So Jesus now passes through the waters. And just as the people were thrown into the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus goes into the wilderness and he conquers evil for 40 days and 40 nights. And just as Moses ascended Sinai, so does Jesus ascend a new mountain with a new law. He is indeed the newer and greater Moses. And so we find for ourselves we are dominated by our adversary and by sin. But we find freedom in the person of Jesus. And we have a revelation from a new and greater prophet, from a new and greater mountain. And now we exist as his followers, lights to the world, 
just as the Israelites were lights to the nations. And I'll close out with this one verse. John 5, 46, Jesus says, If you believe Moses, you would believe me. Why? For he wrote of me. May I suggest to you, Moses was an incredible deliverer. But even he pointed to the greatest of all deliverers. If you need to come into union with this great deliverer tonight, Jesus went into the waters of baptism, innocent, so that he could meet us down there in those waters with him. And so we're baptized into Christ, into all the blessings that this new exodus promises for us. Let's stand and sing about it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've been given to come together tonight uh, to study from your word, and we're so thankful that David could join us, and, and we're thankful for his talents and how he's devoted his life to sharing those talents, or using those talents to share your word. Uh, we're so thankful for the story of redemption, uh, this plan that you've came up with to give us all the opportunity uh, to spend eternity with you in heaven, and we just pray that as we leave here tonight, we can go into the world, we can share that message of love and, and that message of redemption with other people and bring souls to Christ. We thank you for everything you do for us, but most of all, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.